have one more child or add one more brother or sister to the world. So reproductive success was expanded to include not just children, but also effects on other relatives where these effects are devalued by your degree of relatedness to that relative. Degree of relatedness being the chance for any given gene in you that a copy is found in that relative. Um, now, a, a number of people prior to Darwin had posited the notion of evolution, but none of them really organized evidence very systematically to support it. And that Darwin did thoroughly. Every aspect of biology that he knew, comparative anatomy, embryology, paleontology, any and all of these, he would organize the evidence such that at the end of it you would say evolution had to have taken place. Let me give you just one small example, zoogeography the distribution of animals and plants in nature. He pointed out that oceanic islands, sitting way out there, far distant from other land, by his theory, they had to have been colonized from some near mainland, or some quite distant mainland. They could not have just been dropped down by God when the world was created. If they were colonized, then certain things would be true. For example, small mammals can colonize distant islands by riding on tree trunks much more easily or flying than large mammals. So it should not surprise us that the mammalian fauna on small oceanic islands consists of rats and bats, slightly overstating the matter. Uh, likewise, frogs with their wet skin typically wet outer skin are very vulnerable to seawater, drying up during a long voyage. So you do not tend to have frog, uh, uh, frogs that live in ponds or little lakes on, on oceanic islands. Instead, if you have any, they're tree frogs, which live in trees and already have a dry skin. You find many, many lizards, not many frogs. He did experiments. He would have down in his basement huge vats of seawater, and he'd toss in the seeds of various plants that he knew had colonized some distant island, by his theory, and he would compute how fast the ocean currents were going, and he'd haul the seed out after 80 days and plant it. And he proved thereby that indeed plants could be colonizing these distant areas. So this was the work he did on, on evolution, establishing it beyond a reasonable doubt, and at the same time supplying a mechanism. Now, evolution was accepted widely before long, before too long. When I say widely, that does not include the United States of America, you understand, where still less than half of people claim to, quote, believe in evolution, like, I believe or I don't believe. Uh, only Turkey of the nations that have been canvassed shows less of a, a lust for Darwin's thinking than the United States. But elsewhere, and certainly in advanced countries like Scandinavian countries, 80% uh, are convinced by now that evolution has taken place. All right. Now, some people who, and this is often people that don't have such a good idea, they're, they're not very interested in the problems associated with the idea. They run from them or hide them. But Darwin was exactly the other way around. Indeed, he kept a special notebook where objections to his theory were kept so that he would be sure to deal with them. And I want to mention four. And he describes his reaction to them in physical terms. The eye made him shudder when he just looked at the eye. It just contradicted his theory on the spot, as I'll come back to. The sterile ants, that is, ants that were not reproducing, like most of the ants that you step on. Most of the ants without wings do not reproduce, yet they're adult and they evolve. Now, how on earth is that happening? They're not leaving any surviving offspring. So how are their genes changing? What's going on here? 
Um, there was a description in the late 18th century of orchids, flower, that did not have any nectar, and yet they were pollinated by insects. Now this bothered him a lot because he said, if you could ever show me that an animal or a plant was doing something for some other species benefit and not their own, it would annihilate his theory on the spot. So here you've got insects pollinating orchids and yet they're not getting a reward. So his reaction to that was to disbelieve it. But he didn't leave it at disbelief. He then studied the matter. And finally, the peacock's tail made him sick, he said, whenever he saw that, because he had this notion of natural selection as always improving your ability to survive, because it was survival that led to reproduction. And the same traits that were good for survival were also good for, let us say, producing many children if you were female. But why these peacock's tail? That would seem to get in the way of survival. So it made him sick. Now let me take up each of these in just a little bit more detail. Um, the eye was, is a very, if not a perfect, at least a very complex and beautiful camera. And how are you going to get that through small changes taking place, building up over long periods of time? because part of his notion of evolution by natural selection, not just natural selection, and that it led to change over time, but it was gradual change. And this was important to him. There were not big jumps where suddenly a new form appeared and spread. He knew that heredity produced gradual changes, and these were the ones that selection had to act on. So what he did was to organize all the evidence on the comparative anatomy of eyes from eyes that just consisted of a couple of light-sensitive cells on the surface to eyes that had the light-sensitive cells but now they were in a concave surface where the light was gathered slightly better to eyes that had a primitive focusing device etc 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 in other words he convinced himself and others that you could see gradations not of course every single one but enough to make it plausible that the, this complicated organ could have evolved from very simple beginnings. Now, pollination without reward, um, as he said, his theory was fatal if any trait evolved for the exclusive good of another species. He ended up writing an entire book on it, on the various contrivances by which orchids are fertilized by insects. And it turns out, we know now, there are about 18,500 species of orchids. They're a very uh, speciose group, uh, family of uh, plants. And 5% are pollinated by sexual deception. That is, the insect is fooled into thinking the orchid is a female of his species. The orchid more or less looks like a female of his species, but it delivers a smell that is very close to the smell of the female of the pollinating uh, species. Incidentally, it plays a cruel game on the male, as happens in other systems of sexual deception. They arouse the male, but they don't give him a climax, because they don't want him to. They don't want the male landing on an orchid and saying, oh, what a lovely female, and going all the way, and then he says, all right, let me have a, a good beer and a good night's sleep, and then we'll try it again. They want him going from flower to flower to flower. So he's got, so to speak, a permanent erection and no satisfaction. All right. Incidentally, it's little known that a third of orchids are pollinated by food deception. That is, they mimic food that the uh, pollinator uh, would like to eat. Of course, there's no food there. And 